Ephesians, the last book of the Bible. It's very easy to find. I want to preach some messages out of the book of Revelation for you. I uh, also want you to know that on Thursdays, this, this Thursday, we're still in Romans, uh, Romans 16, this Thursday at the Wycliffe Memorial Evangelical Church at 6 o'clock. Um, but very soon, we're going to be studying through the book of Revelation. And uh, so doing a study through the book of Revelation. So uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at a few things, and I'm going to give you some, some tips or some highlights here. We're going to be talking about heaven. Heaven, what's heaven like? And talk about that. The Bible tells us what heaven's like. And we're going to read the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 4. So let's all stand as we read God's word together. We do have a text verse, verses, verse 6. That's our text verse tonight. I'll read the first verse, and then we'll read every other verse together in unison. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Ready? And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight, like unto an emerald. Ready? And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Ready? And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had the face of as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they had rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And let's pray. Father, we do lift up these prayers to you tonight, for surely tonight we're asking that you would please perform a miracle in her life and keep her alive. And, and we pray that there would be healing, and, and um, this is what we want. Lord, we know that everything works according to your will. And um, But we, we lift up these prayers for her, asking that you would intercede in her life and keep her with us longer. We, we, we are selfish. We want to keep her. We know that heaven is a wonderful place for her, and we know she's going there. But please, please, if, uh, if you can keep her with us, we, we, we ask you to do so. And then also, Lord, we lift up Jillian tonight. We lift up others in our church. We thank you that Dave is well even though after his asthma attack today and others in our church that are, are well, they're tired, and the different other issues going on, Lord, I just pray that you would please work in our church and our people. We thank you for the great crowd that's here tonight. Every person here has needs. Lord, I pray you'd need, meet our needs tonight. Help us. I pray you'd bring uh, illumination to our hearts as we look into your word. Help us to understand it. And I uh, pray the Holy Spirit would come in power and use me tonight to speak to the hearts of everybody here. And uh, thank you so much for what you've done in our lives and what you're going to do. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you. Years ago, I, I was going through a difficult time. There was a family in our church down in London that 
had, had faced a very dire time and I can't get into all the details. It's very private and personal, so I'm not going to do that. But I remember the lady, I asked her, I said, what do you really want? And she said, all I want is peace. All I want is peace. The title of my message tonight is Peace is the Best Explanation of Heaven that I Believe We Can Find. What is heaven like? Peaceful. It's peaceful. I think we all want peace. We want it in our lives. Uh, we struggle, and we want peace. We want peace in our nation. We want peace in our government. We want peace in our world. We'd love to have world peace. Unfortunately, many times people go to the wrong source of peace. And when we do this, what happens is we bring conflict into our lives. Yet when we look into heaven, and tonight we're going to look into heaven. You say, what does heaven look like? Well, the Bible tells us. What is heaven going to look like when we go to heaven? What are we going to see? Well, the Bible tells us what heaven is like. And there's something there in heaven that I, I'm, going to, I'm going to point out. Because what you see is symbology. As we read through the verses, I know you saw some pretty bizarre things. Or the describing things were bizarre. Uh, the, the, the beasts. Full of eyes, you know, the one that looks like a lion, one looks like a calf, one looks, has the face of a man, one like a flying eagle. I'll, 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 just, I'll explain that to you, what they are, what they, what they represent. Because they do represent something real, something tangible. And so I want to talk about that tonight. Because you see, heaven is a place of peace. Yet, well, let me just go into it. Let me just teach you. There's, I mean, there's so many things that I want to say tonight, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to, we're, going to, we're going to go to heaven tonight. Okay? Now, we're not going to go there physically. We're going to go there theologically, and we're going to go there scripturally. So we're going to go to heaven tonight, and we're going to look at heaven, what, what heaven looks like, because the Bible describes heaven. And I believe that some people, believe, theologians believe that when Apostle John had this uh, this. this this experience that he was still on Patmos when he had this experience. And I don't believe that. I believe that he was actually caught up into heaven. He actually went to the place of heaven and he ex described what he saw when he got there. You say, well, I've had people say to me, well, nobody's been to heaven to describe it. Well, guess what? Yes, they have. John went there and he described it. So, if anybody wants to see what heaven looks like, they all, all they have to do is go to Revelation chapter 4 and you'll know what it looks like. What is heaven like? Well, first of all, heaven is peace. But I want you to see, we're going to look at the verses and I'm going to, t I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain to you what this is all about. First of all, you look at verse 1. It says, after this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, heaven, going to heaven is like entering into, as far as the best way we can explain it is like another dimension. It's like another dimension. And there's this door, there's this portal. that, that uh, And I've, I've, heard, I've read books and, and I've heard people describe going to heaven because there are people that have gone to heaven and they've come back. And they talk about there's an actual door, there's an actual portal where they will go and enter into the presence of God. Okay, And so here's this, this door. He says it's set in heaven. And that's the heaven that we're talking about going that he's going to. And the first voice that I heard, as it were, and the first voice is talking about the, in chapter 1, he hears somebody who is actually the glorified Christ, and that's Jesus, okay? So that's Jesus, the first voice that's speaking. And it says here, and it was, and I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. So it was a very loud voice, very authoritative, because that's what a trumpet does. And it says, which said, come up hither. So heaven is up, isn't it? So come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. Now, there's a certain prophetical event that will happen, and I have a lot to cover tonight, folks, but there's a certain prophetical event that will happen to all believers in Jesus Christ. We call it the rapture. 
Okay? The rapture is, is the word rapture is a, is, a, is a Latin word which means to be caught up. Okay? To be caught up. And uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, it talks about this rapture, and we don't have time to go there. You can write down that, that reference if you'd like to see it. There's also other references as well. Uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians really cover the rapture and give prophetical events for the church age, which is a, it's an amazing study. And, of course, we don't have time to look at it tonight. But he's talking about this event that's going to happen to all believers in the future where we're going to be taken up into heaven immediately without dying. Okay, it's a future prophetical event where the Lord's going to come, a trumpet's going to sound, and the Bible says the dead are going to come down, they're going to meet their bodies, and as they go up to the, the heaven, it says we're going to be caught up with them in the clouds. We're just going to go bang, we're going to disappear, and we're going to go and be with the Lord in the clouds. Okay, it's an amazing prophetical event, and it's, it's going to happen. And, uh, and, and so John is talking about this event, And he's talking about actually going up to heaven, okay? So he says, come up hither and I will show thee the things that must be hereafter. So he's gonna, he's gonna show him the future, alright? That's the Lord Jesus is speaking, he's gonna show him the future. And then verse 2 says, and immediately I was in the Spirit. So what happened was, the Spirit of God actually caught him up. Okay? Uh, in, in Acts chapter 8, uh, there's a man named Philip, and he, and he wit- witnesses to an Ethiopian eunuch, and the Bible says that the Spirit catches him up. So, somehow, the Spirit actually picked this man up, Philip, and took him somewhere else. Can you imagine that? Talk about air travel. That is an amazing uh, airplane to, to enter into. And uh, here you have uh, uh, John entering into the Spirit, and he's going up. Okay, because he says, come up hither. And he, the first things, the first thing that he sees, the first thing that he sees is a throne. You see that? It says a throne set in heaven. So the first thing that we're going to see when we enter into heaven is a throne. Now that throne, and, I, and for lack of a better word, that throne must be awesome. Must be amazing. For lack of a better word. It must be, I mean, we, I, we don't have words to describe with that throne, but it must be an incredible sight. And there he goes, he's, he's, he's looking at this huge, enormous, without explanation, throne, and it's set there. So it's just set there. And then he sees somebody sitting on the throne. Now who is that? Well, by the way, a throne is a symbol of authority. Amen. And when the, the one that sits on the throne is showing their authority over the whole world and over the whole universe. And who is that? Well, it's God. It's God. And then there's a description of him in verse 3. And he that sat on the throne was to look like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, sardine or sardius. Okay? Sardine or sardius stone. And that's very interesting because Jasper on the breastplate, and I would, once again, there's a lot that I, I that, a lot of symbology here, but if you go into the Old Testament, there was a man who had the, had the office called the high priest, and on his breast, there was 12 stones on his breast. Now, the first stone, the first stone was was the sardine stone. That was the first stone. And the last stone was the jasper stone. Okay? So that's very interesting. And I, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, I believe that's pointing to Jesus Christ because He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and He's the end. He's the first and He's the last. And that's what it's pointing to. Okay? But not only that, it says there's a rainbow going around the throne. Look at verse 3 again. It says... And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And I'm going to talk about the emerald in a minute. But that rainbow that surrounds the throne was a symbol that God gave to Noah after the flood that he wasn't going to bring judgment on the world again by a flood. That's right. 
And so what God did is he has his rainbow surround. It must be a beautiful rainbow. I, I love rainbows. How many love rainbows? You just love to love. Isn't it great? Oh, I love a rainbow. Boy, you know, it, when anybody says, there's a rainbow, I'm immediately going like that and looking at it. I just love rainbows. And here you got a rainbow surrounding the throne. Must be an amazing sight now. And it says that this rainbow is like a jasper stone. Now the rainbow is peace. Amen. The rainbow is a symbol of peace because God said, I'm going to make peace with the world and I'm not bringing a flood anymore. Right. And then he says that it's in the sight is like an emerald. Now emeralds are green. They're green. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there are two very important colors on our planet. You ever notice that? Two very important colors on our planet. One is blue. The sky. Amen? And the other one is green. And did you know, they'll tell you that the colors blue and green are colors that bring calmness to people. Isn't that interesting? They bring peace. So I believe that what he's saying in a, in a great way, he's saying that this rainbow is peace. And it's so much peace, it looks like an emerald. Amazing. But we go on. Verse number four, it says, And about the throne and were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sit and clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And you say, well, what are the 24 elders? What does that stand for? Well, that's very interesting. What's two, what's 12 plus, what's 12 times two? 24. Okay. Well, I'm not too sure exactly what the 24 elders stand for, but I'll tell you this. I know that they are redeemed people because they're wearing white robes and that's a symbol of redemption. That's what we're going to wear someday. We're going to have white robes on them. We're going to he said, what am I going to look like when I get to heaven? You're going to have a white robe on. And that's a symbol of the fact that God has forgiven you of all your sins. And you're spotless. You're like, you're, you're, you're just spotless. You're forgiven. That's, that's, and by the way, you're just as forgiven today as you will be then. Amen. He, he forgave you completely. When you accepted him as your personal savior, he forgave you completely. And someday you're going to wear a white robe because you've trusted him. And these men are wearing white robes. You say, what are they? Well, I believe that very likely they're the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament as a witness. Because there are 12 tribes of Israel and there are 12 apostles. So, you get Old Testament, you have 12 tribes. In the New Testament, you have 12 apostles. God started it with 12 tribes in the Old Testament. He started the New time, the New Testament with 12 apostles. And what do you have? 24. Very good, isn't it? You say, was that what that means? Well, it's very also interesting because it's two formations and Jesus' number is two because he's the second Adam. So you see a lot of symbols here. We could go on all day and talk about the symbols, but look at verse 5 because we've got to hasten here. And it says, And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices. What do the lightnings and thunderings and voices stand for? I believe this. I believe the lightnings are immediate judgment. Boy, when lightning hits, it goes quick, doesn't it? Bang! Have you ever seen lightning strike? I mean, have you ever been close to lightning when it strikes? Boy, that put the fear of God in you. Like nothing else will. I mean, it's just... oh. I remember one time I was out fishing in the mountains... I was a young man. I was out trout fishing. And, and I love to fish, folks. Anybody who knows me knows I love to fish. And I was out fishing. And I was, catching, I was catching a lot of trout that day. I mean, I was catching a lot. And all of a sudden, this big storm came. And I didn't want to leave. But when that lightning bolt hit the tree about 50 yards away from me. And I saw how big that lightning bolt was. I was done with my fishing. And every hair on my head was up on end, too. And I was running. In fact, I don't think I even... Collected my tackle. I think I left the fish in the water that I caught and I went out of there quick. It's scary. So you have lightnings 
which is immediate judgment because God can do that. And by the way, lightnings come from God. And then the thunderings are the warning voices of God. God, because when you hear the thundering, you know it's the lightnings right there, don't you? But when you hear thunder, that doesn't mean that it's right there, but it's coming. And then the voices, the voices. I believe that's the witnesses of these things, the Bible. This is the voice of God, the voices of God. We have 66 books here, over 40 authors. We have 39 on the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. This is the Word of God. So you have the voices, the, the witnesses, the many witnesses. But really, when we talk about the Word of God, the Bible says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is the Word of God. Amen? That's right. So then we go on here. And it says here, there are seven lamps. You see that seven lamps? It says there are seven lamps and they're burning before the throne of God. And the seven lamps is a menorah. Okay? You say, what is a menorah? Well, that is a Jewish symbol. And it's a one lamp stand and there's two branches out there like that and they make seven. Okay? And they're made of beaten gold, which is... And they, they picture Christ. They really do. And I don't have time to explain it to you, but it's an amazing thing. I mean, the lighting of the lamps, they were made of olive oil. Every, I mean, the oil lit the lamps, and, the, and that's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's just amazing, folks. It's gonna, you're going to see these things. I mean, you see the throne. You're going to see the 24 elders. You're going to see the, you're gonna see the, the, the bow Around the throne, you're going to see, you're going to see the, uh, the man sitting upon the throne, which is God. You're going to see the 24 elders. You're going to hear the lightning, or the, the, not hear the lightning, you're going to see the lightnings and hear the thunderings and you're going to hear the voices, just like he heard them. And you're going to see that menorah, that beautiful lamp stand. But the thing I really want to concentrate on and focus on is verse number six. And it says, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like unto a crystal. Do you see that? What is that? The sea of glass? You know what that means? When you look at, gla- when you look at the ocean, or you look at water, and that water is so still, it looks solid. And I believe that what that means and what that symbolizes is that God is never unruffled and He's never unfazed. And before Him is always tranquility. It's never ruffled. God is always peaceful. Folks, have you ever been unruffled? Have you ever been ruffled? Has there been times in your life where the the ocean in front of you is just churning? and It's never that way with God. It's never that way. Now, we're going to get back to that, but that's what I'm talking about. He's always at peace. But the next thing I want you to see, and we're just going to look at all these types, and you'll understand what they're all about. And it says, And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, the full of eyes, you say, well, that's, that's grotesque. Can you imagine somebody full of eyes? Can you imagine me walking in here and I've got an eye on my elbow and an eye over here and an eye over here and an eye here and I, you know, and I walk in there and you're all just staring at me. (laughs) What is wrong with him? Look at him. (laughs) That's, that's grotesque. I mean, (laughs) you could just see, watch me walk into a restaurant. I got eyes behind my head. I got eyes on this. People just kind of, the whole restaurant just stops and everybody goes, yeah. Well, what's that all about? What's the symbol? Those are cherubims. They're very powerful angels. In fact, they're some of the most powerful angels that there are. There's four of them. All right? Now, the eyes all over them is symbolizing God. In fact, the cherubims symbolize God. They symbolize Christ. Okay? And the, the eyes all over them is symbolizing the omnipresence of God, the fact that God is everywhere. That's what that symbolizes. Okay? You say, all right. 
What are, what, what are they all? What are they all? There's four of them. What's that mean? How many Gospels? Four. Those cherubims are the Gospels visualized. By the way, Ezekiel saw the same four creatures. In Ezekiel chapter 1, just write it down. You can do the study later. He saw the four Gospels visualized 700 years B.C. And John saw the same vision. And he's describing it. Okay? But you can see he gets it in order. In Ezekiel, it's not necessarily in order. And, it, and there's a reason for that. And we won't get into that. But I want you to notice what they look like. The first one, it says, it has the face of a lion. Okay? That's verse 7. What's that talking about? He was like a lion. Well, that's Matthew. The book of Matthew pictures Jesus as a lion from the tribe of Judah. And there are more Old Testament references in the book of Matthew than all the four Gospels. The book of Matthew is an excellent book to witness to a Jewish person. Excellent. More Old Testament references written by Matthew, the publican. Very interesting. The second one is like a calf. Calves are, calves or cows are serving animals. We, get their, we eat their meat. We get milk from them. They serve us. They plowed our fields when the farmers had cows. They would, and oxen, those, those, they would serve mankind. So a cow is actually a serving animals. And so that's a picture of the book of Mark. And that is Jesus as a servant. Okay, so the book of Mark is the shortest of all the Gospels. Only 16 chapters in the book of Mark. And it talks about his works, his miracles. So if somebody really loves miracles, that's an excellent gospel to witness to somebody, the book of Mark. Then the third one is the book of Luke. That's the man. Okay, Luke was a physician. Luke is the most detailed of all the gospels. When we have the Christmas story, most people go to the book of Luke and read Luke chapter 2 because it's the most detailed of all the gospel accounts. The book of Luke is a very detailed gospel and so it's good for intellectual people to read the book of Luke. The book of John is the flying eagle. That's Jesus as the Son of God, or God the Son. As the eagle flies way over and is unreachable, that shows the glory and the highness of God, that He is an almighty, all-high God. And these four creatures which John describes as beasts, these angelic creatures are around about the throne and they are, they are all visualizing and symbolizing Jesus Christ. We're going to see that. Okay? Verse 8, these creatures are giving glory to God. And it says, And the four beasts, each of them with six wings about him, that's speaking of Jesus in his manhood. Six is the number of man. And they were full of eyes within and that's speaking of his his um, the, the fact that he's everywhere and that you can you, that you can look on the inside of him and it's absolute purity, and they have rest they rest not day nor night, saying holy, holy, holy. There's the Trinity, Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. That's speaking of Jesus. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne, who liveth with forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And here is the reason why God created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to bring God pleasure. And when we bring God pleasure, we're happy. That's a key right there. Now, I'm not going to preach on that. But the thing that I want you to see, the underlying factor of all this is peace. Underlying factor, the rainbow is peace. The emerald, peace. But before that throne, in the place of struggle, in the place of trial, is peace. A sea of tranquility like a crystal. Why is that? 
Why is that throne and why is it that heaven is a place of peace? Number one, because Jesus is there. Folks, Jesus is not only the way to peace, he is peace. You know, people, they run away from Jesus to find peace. Can I tell you something? You will never find peace away from the Prince of Peace. You will never find peace. This world will never find peace without Jesus. It was never said about any leader that has ever lived when he was born. There was no star that shone down. And there were no angels that proclaimed peace, goodwill toward men. But Jesus, he is peace. He is peace. Paul in Romans chapter 15, verse 33, and we were reading it on Thursday night, and really this is where I got my message, but it says, For He, Christ, is our peace. He is peace. He's called the God of peace. It says here, it says, Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And when we think of Christ, let me tell you something. Folks, when you study Christianity and you go back to ancient Christianity, and you go back to the language of Latin, you'll see two Latin letters. The first one is a P. The first one is an X. What does that stand for? The X is chai. The P is pax. It means pa- peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Or Pax Christos. See, many times people took that phrase or those symbols and they put it on a garment or they put it on a wall or they put it in a, on a building and, they, and, and it, it lost its meaning. It just became religious. It became a religious symbol. And it lost its full meaning of what it really stands for. But let me tell you something. You cannot have peace without Jesus. You cannot have peace without Jesus to save you. You cannot have peace without Jesus to live in you. To live with you. You cannot have peace in your life unless you yield your life to Jesus Christ. He's on that throne. And before that throne is a sea of crystal like glass. Why? Because He's peace. His peace. It says in Colossians 1.20, it says, And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He made peace by the blood of His cross. That cross is a cross. That cross right there is a symbol of peace. The man hanging upon that cross is a man that, that, that came to shed his blood to bring peace to humanity. That peace and goodwill towards men was what he did on the cross. The fact that he died on the cross for your sins and mine. The fact that he paid for our sins and shed his precious blood and gave us everlasting life when we accepted him. He's peace. He's peace. I can picture the disciples out there on the water, the Sea of Galilee. The winds start to blow. They start to flow down. Those winds come down. They hit the waves. The waves become large. They start going into the boat. Jesus is sleeping. He's sleeping. They wake Him up. What does He do? He says, peace, be still. And bang! Can you imagine that? Here they are going, oh, oh! What happened? The wind stopped. There was this calmness, this eerie calmness. I mean, <laughs> what's going on? Just a minute ago, I mean, we were fighting for our lives and now it just... Whoosh. That's because the Master of Peace said peace. And listen, when Jesus says peace, there's peace. (laughs) There's peace. When Jesus made peace with me, there's peace. When I accepted Him in 1984, 
as my personal Savior, when I asked Him to be my Savior, He made peace. He said, peace, Dave. Peace. Peace. And although even after that day, there's been some turmoil in my life, and although the winds, they, they still blow, let me tell you something. If I just continue to put my faith in Jesus Christ, it, nothing ruffles Him. Nothing. You ever been ruffled? Come on. You ever been ruffled? Yeah. You been through torment? Yelling, crying out, screaming, fighting, clawing, everything else? And before your throne of life, there's turmoil, isn't there? Let me tell you something. Before God's throne, there is no turmoil. None at all. There's a sea of crystal in front of his throne. So still that sea of crystal is solid. It's not moved ever. It's never been a moment that that sea has even bumped. For all eternity before that throne, when we go and we look at that throne and we, we look at the, 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 uh, the awesome sight, the amazing, incredible sight, and we see that throne and we see God on that throne and we look before that throne. Still. No movement. Why? Because Jesus is there. Number two, because Christ is in control. Folks, 2012, what are we going to do? The, smart, the stock market is crashing. Everybody's going at each other's throats. Looks like we're going to have a division in the ruling party. Clawing, fighting, kicking, screaming, yelling. What's going on? Peace. Be still. He's in control. You know, you're reading that site there. If you carry on reading, and we're going to do a study through the book of Revelation coming up. If you carry on reading, you get to these seven seal judgments. The seal judgments. There's four sets of seven judgments. There's the seals, the trumpets, the thunders. Don't forget about the thunders. Most people do. And then the vials. Four sets of seven judgments. That's about to happen. The world's going to go through turmoil, but before the throne of God. And the reason why the world's going to go through turmoil is because the world is rejecting peace. Running away from it. I'll give, I'll give out tracks. You're giving out loads this week. And, 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 and I'll, walk down the, I'll be walking down the pavement. I'll see one that's crumpled up. And somebody just took it and threw it down. I've seen them throwing them down. Now, that doesn't happen often. And I believe a lot of people take those home. Why do people run away from peace? Why do we do that? That's crazy. I mean, before God's throne, it's, it's still. And before our thrones, it's, it's crazy. It's insane. See, God is not phased. Oh, oh, oh 2012. I'm, I'm sure God's just trembling up there. He's just... <laughs> God is just so scared. 2012, oh, the Lord doesn't know what He's going to do, folks. And He's at the end of His tether. Heaven is going crazy tonight. Angels are flying around telling them what's going on. No, it isn't. Hey, folks, did it ever occur to you that it's never occurred to God? Whoops and oh oh are not in God's dictionary. They're in mine. Use them very often. Whoops. I forgot something. Uh oh. Has that ever happened? Missed that meeting. Uh oh. 
God never misses meetings. He's always on time. Yeah. But, 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 but did you hear about the Mayans in 2012? The world's going to end. Folks, the world's not going to end in 2012, okay? It's not going to end. The book of Revelation tells us how it's going to end, and it's not going to end like that. Okay? So the Mayans are wrong. And that preacher this year, there was a there was this preacher, radio preacher that came out and said, the world's going to end in, in uh, I think it was in October. <laughs> and everybody, we were going to sell their stuff. And I thought, you're nuts. What are you doing? It's not going to end like that. The Bible tells us this guy's supposed to be a Bible theologian. It's not going to end like that. He comes as a thief in the night. He doesn't come, you know, it, 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 it's, it's going to come suddenly. It's not going to be coming like, you know, oh, yeah. oh, I think we can see that we're getting close to the end. But folks, God's in control. He's in control. See, trouble. You know, folks, just settle down. Settle down. Just trust Him. Just trust Him. He can take care of anything. There's nothing that God, and this isn't good good English, but it's definitely good theology. There's nothing that God can't take care of. It's a double negative, by the way. But I'm not known for my excellence in speech. But as long as the theology is all right, it's okay, right? Right? Trust Him. He can take care of anything. Look, look, folks, He can take care of you. And He can take care of me. Oh, but the... Peace. Peace. You know what we need to do? We need to bring a little heaven to earth. We need to bring a little heaven to our lives. Huh? Yeah? Because I get... People want to... What's the... What's the... The Lord's Prayer. There's something in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into... Tim. No, no. Everybody, people like to chant this. Uh, Yeah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, as it is in heaven. Okay, okay, yeah, well, thy will be done on earth. Where are we? We're here. As it is in heaven. Before God's throne is a sea of glass. Why don't we make our lives, before our lives, sea of glass too? I'm not saying we're God. I'm saying we trust Him and we put Him in His rightful place in our lives. And then when we do that, we have peace. You know why I'm not worried? Because, number one, He sits on the throne. When somebody sits, wait, look, look, if I'm, if I'm sitting on the throne, or I'm sitting, I'm in control. When I start standing up, I'm out of control. God is in control. He just sits down. He says, hey, peace. God is in control. He sits upon the throne. That's why he's not, he's not worried. He's not, oh, we're going to have a big angel meeting tonight. We're going to get all the, gather all the millions of angels together. We're having a little bit of a crisis on planet Earth. 2012 is coming. And there's a crisis. I, must, I need to meet with Michael immediately. That never happens.
Hey, not only does he sit on the throne, but on the throne there's that the two stones, the sardius, and there's the jasper. He's the alpha. He's the omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the final word or letter of the Greek alphabet. So it's like saying the A and the Z. That's what he is. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first. Folks, if he's the first, is there anybody in front of him? If I'm the first person in the queue, is there anybody in front of me? He's God. When he says, I'm the first, I'm the last, he means he's God. If he wasn't God, he'd say, I'm the second. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm the first. He says, I'm also the last. Nobody behind him. If I'm the last person in the queue, is there anybody behind me? Uh-uh. And all the time he sits on that throne, what does he see? Rainbow. Do you know what that is? That's a constant reminder to God that He may, He makes peace with us. He just looks. Oh yeah. And then He looks in front of Him. What does He see? He sees the rainbow. He sees the sea. The sea of glass. Like a crystal. And God says, Me worry? Uh Uh-uh. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith in 2012? But, but... uh, Where's your faith? It's going to be like a storm. The wind's going to blow. And... Hey, you know the worst thing that could happen to us? We'll go to heaven. Oh, that's awful. It's not awful. I said, you know, Shirley, I, I want Shirley to live. She's 70 years old and I want her to live. And I'm praying. And I was up at 3.30 this morning. God woke me up at 3.30 this morning and said, pray for Shirley. Okay. But I'd like to sleep. Okay, I'd pray for her. So I did. Prayed for Shirley. 3.30 in the morning. Because she needed me to pray for her. And I said to Brother Anderson, I said, you know the worst thing that could happen to Shirley? She'll go to heaven. Oh, that's bad. She's in God's hands. Just as I'm in God's hands. Just as you're in God's hands. The the most important thing is that we trust Him as our personal Savior. Trust Him. Trust in peace. You said, I have done that. Best decision you've ever made. Best decision those three teenagers made tonight. Standing out there. And and Gavin says, what do you think? Tell them, what do you think about today? And I said, hey, fellas, that was the best decision you've ever made. Today, was what you did sealed your eternity before Him. Mm-hmm. Best decision. It's a sardine, the jasper, the rainbow of like an emerald, the green. Calmness, peace, and a sea of glass. And all I'm saying is it never changes. That never ruffles. It's so still. It's turned to crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, all I'm saying is this, and I'll close. I'm in my last sentence, which means another 20 minutes. Just kidding. Trust Him. Serve Him. Live for Him and go forward. You say, what are you going to do in 2000 and 20,000, 2012? 
Yeah, 2012. What are you going to do in 2012? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do three things. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to serve him. And I'm going forward. And I want you to come with me. Let's go forward together. Let's just like an army of God's people. You're God's people. Many of you became God's people this year. You know what? I, am, I didn't see you back in March when I preached in March. Many of you. I didn't see you in February. But I see you tonight. On a night with school tomorrow. Kids need to get home. I'll, I'm almost done. But you're here. And the reason why is because you want to be here. Nobody had to drag you out of your house tonight. You came because you wanted to be here. Some of you came, you sacrificed, you're here. You're tired. I know some of you, you're fighting. You're tired. You're tired. It's understandable. You work hard. I won't get mad at you. know what? I don't get mad at people that get tired in, in church because I know you work hard. If you're working hard, you're going to be tired. Okay. You're tired, but you're here tonight. And all I'm saying is, when you face 2012, trust Him. Read Revelation 4 tonight. Think about what we talked about and, and get on your knees and say, God, Lord, nothing phases you. Thank you for helping me. I trusted you as my personal Savior this year. Thank you for bringing somebody into my pathway so that I could trust Jesus. And I'm looking, most everybody, and there's a, I could say probably about 80% of the crowd here, you've been saved this year. This is your year of salvation. Wow, great. Okay. Some of you, you've been saved longer than that. But all I'm saying is, let's trust Him. Let's serve Him. And then let's go forward for him. Let's bow our heads. Now, you know...